Anytime if I visit everyday feminism, I'm never sure if I'm looking for comedy or cringe. Usually, I get both. While the guys and I were coming up with some articles for Locked and Loaded last night, I came across this in the hopes of getting a cheap laugh. Instead, this is probably one of the more infuriating articles I've ever read when it comes to writing, though not as bad as that GQ article on why you shouldn't read classic books. Ah, what better way to celebrate my birthday than this? From Everyday Feminism, because words matter, feminist editors share how they make their style guides less oppressive by Katie Tastrum. And oh joy, this was written yesterday. Just look at that title. Oh, you just gotta dismantle everything, don't you? You know, that complicated system of communication we use called language? Fuck it, let's burn that son of a bitch down. Who needs clarity in speech? I like how they need to include obvious as fuck subtitles in all their photos, too. I mean, what the hell do you think I thought this was a photo of? Anyway, let's just go through this dumpster fire and get it over with. As feminists, we know that words have power. So many of the microaggressions we deal with relate to how words are used towards us and to describe us. Intersectional feminism requires that we pay close attention to our words and how they may reinforce racism, sexism, and other oppressions. Well, I do think it's important to be very selective with words, but we shouldn't consider every single possible interpretation of every single phrase. That's just completely unrealistic. Why the hell would you even do that? How we talk about people, things, and ideas has a huge material impact. Subtle choices between phrases can reinforce certain worldviews, and messaging is crucial to the advancement of political movements. <laughs> material impact. Material. Not quite there, pal, or palette, I guess, in this case. The second sentence I don't disagree with, but you need to know who your target audience is. Clearly, either I'm not in this writer's target audience, or they aren't putting much emphasis on persuading me. For example, if someone is writing a seemingly objective article about abortion, whether they call people who think abortion should be illegal, pro-life, or anti-choice, or pro-abortion, anti-abortion, etc., frames the debate. Most articles that you read on the internet pass through an editor, who generally uses style guides to help guide their decision making. Before I became a writer, I thought style guides were about fashion, so don't feel bad if this is an unfamiliar concept to you. If you went to college, you may have familiar... May have familiar... What? With style guides from the American Psychological Association or the Modern Language Association. Style guides lay out what a particular outfit prefers and allows when it comes to language, usage, and grammar. Alright, make like a criminal and stop right there. The purpose of style guides is to ensure consistency for certain types of writing, something this clearly woke individual is obviously afraid of. You wouldn't use an academic writing style reserved for a research paper on 14th century nobles when drafting a technical manual on the key features and functions of a board game. If you were to do this, the manual might be readable, but it'll be clunky and awkward because you'd be using the improper style. Someone's taking too much of a fictional approach to non-fictional writing. For example, whether or not an outlet allows the use of the singular they is a style guide issue, but also relates to a broader political movement for rights and recognition for trans and non-binary people. Oh, <sighs> Christ, we've been over this already. They cannot refer to a singular person in almost any context, and if you try to use it as a gendered pronoun, it fucks up syntax. If you're using they to discuss trans and non-binary rights, I might let it slide, but trying to enforce it beyond that scope is fucking retarded. As of April 2017, even mainstream sources like the Washington Post, the AP, and the New York Times allow a singular they if that is how a subject identifies. If you are still opposed to this change, you are on the wrong side of history. Oh, fucking hell, can you keep your politics in your pants for once? I thought we were talking about style guides here. These seemingly small choices have a much broader reverberation throughout the culture, and can help to subtly reinforce cultural norms for good and for bad. Word choice helps prove that objectivity is a myth, as decisions must be made. Incorrect. Word choice helps prove that objectivity is a truth, as some words have an objectively better use than others. What's a better description for a soda can, round or cylindrical? Both adjectives are valid, but one has a clearer definition than the other. A new source that calls brown people terrorists, but white people quote-unquote disturbed individuals, is making a choice to frame the world in a certain way, 
Certain principles, that's spelled wrong, unite the style choices that feminist editors make. I asked editors at three different online feminist publications about their style guides and how they make decisions around language and identity. Here are some of the concepts that came up the most. Okay, why is brown capitalized? Oh, I, I get it. You're using your own style guide, aren't you? Really taking the fast track to not being taken seriously as a writer. If a news source is framing all brown people as terrorists, we know that's dishonest. We also know that white people have the capacity to be terrorists, Timothy McVeigh, but hashtag not all whites, okay? Unbunch those fucking britches of yours. 1. Make the right distinctions around identity. One outlet that I contribute to, The Body Is Not An Apology, capitalizes the B in black when referring to identity. I asked Maya Medicine, an editor there, about this policy, as it seems to be rather unique. Maya Medicine. This is a name? Capitalize it. This, this isn't some arbitrary rule, okay? The capitalization makes the name significant, otherwise I won't remember it or attribute it to a person. Either you don't know the mechanics of written language, or you're just doing this to spite your English professors. If it's the latter, I honestly can't blame you. This is likely because both the founder of the site, Sonia Renee Taylor, and Maya are both black women. They have the expertise that can only come from lived experience. She explained that, quote, in standard written English, we capitalize all ethnicities, such as Indian American, Asian American, Latinx, I will not pronounce that properly, etc., except for black, even though black is an ethnic identity, clearly. We don't capitalize white, though. And will you please stop putting an X in places where vowels belong? It should be hyphenated if you want people to pronounce your newspeak right. Maya also noted that we capitalize African American, but not Black American, even though the two words are describing the same people. She argued that keeping Black lowercase is stating that to identify as Black is not on par with other folks' ethnic and cultural identities, there's an apostrophe missing there, that it is lesser somehow, that it is less important. Uh, no. You're ascribing malintent to authors that don't capitalize the B in Black. It's got none of the humanitarian or political implications that you're assuming. We simply don't capitalize it because that's how spelling works. Also, why is Maya capitalized here but nowhere else? Can't even follow your own fucking rules. 2. Make sure to include context. Like other editorial decisions, Maya explained that there is a historical element to this discussion. To the discussion of style guides. Enlighten me. There has been a fight to capitalize our people's name, Maya said. For instance, W.E.B. Dubois was arguing that we should capitalize the word Negro, and the New York Times finally did so in the 1940s, as a way to honor the culturally significant contributions of Negroes. Uh... What fight? Where? This is literally the first time I've heard about this. Historical context is also relevant to understanding how and when to make a change. Erica Smith, an editor at Bust wrote that she made changes when she came into her role at Bust two and a half years ago. In the past, sex workers were referred to by more derogatory terms, not specifically by Bust, but generally. After she started, Smith added an entry about how writers should use sex worker instead of other terms, but clarified that if she was editing a piece by a sex worker who preferred another term, I'd most likely defer to their preference. What's the difference between a sex worker and a prostitute besides the number of characters in the name? What other terms are there? Lewd therapist? Okay, Lindsay, are you forgetting that I was a professional twice over, an analyst and a therapist, the world's first analrapist? Yes, and you were almost arrested for those business cards. Yes, no, it did not look good on paper, but I didn't stop because of the police inquiries. I stopped to raise our little daughter. Three, consider standard style guides a starting point. Okay, right from the off, no. No, 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 no. Style guides are a reference, not a starting point. The dictionary is not a starting point for English, for fuck's sake. In particular, many feminist editors often look outside typical style guides to help ensure their site or publication uses respectful language. Amanda Chan, the manager editing at Bustle, explains that their style guide is based on the AP also consulting simultaneously with different groups and stakeholders to make sure our guidelines are as up-to-date and inclusive as possible, even if that means breaking with AP style. 
Like many other feminist-leading publications, many of Bustle's writers are from marginalized groups. For this reason, Chan believes that editors should create space for writers' lived experiences and identities when deciding whether or not to break with AP style. So in short, I don't like these rules, so I'm going to make up my own. Yeah, good luck with that. You and your little circle of friends can keep using your own little subset of language, but don't be surprised when the rest of the world laughs at how your articles read. After all, AP and other traditional style guides might work for some publications, but feminist editors often face unique challenges that AP may have not contemplated when creating its guidelines. Such is the case at Bust Magazine. Smith explains that the publication is based on AP style with a few tweaks. Some of those tweaks come down to the subjects we cover. We have an entry that says Riot Girl should always be spelled with three R's, and some of that is just what our editorial team prefers. <sighs> okay. What the fuck is a riot girl? And who let this autism into my language? It doesn't matter what your editorial team prefers. This is wrong. This is objectively wrong. I get it. You're an artist. You want to be creative. All right, fine, dandy, whatever. Do whatever the fuck you want. But don't try to tell us that your rules are the correct ones when you know damn well that they are not. Four, listen to readers and writers. I'm gonna get really fucking drunk when this is done. Chan sees developing a style guide as a constant and collaborative process, and says they often look to writers who have lived experience as arbiters of what language is and is not appropriate. Having writers with diverse identities is crucial if editors want to stay ahead of language as it evolves. The prioritization of respectful language over strict adherence to a style is typical of the feminist editors I spoke with. Ah, oh, for the love of fuck, AP style is for journalistic publications. I don't care what you think passes for journalism, you should be using the AP style guide and nothing else. I understand that language changes, but you just can't invent a new set of rules and expect it to stick overnight. A lot of making changes to the style guide is about listening to writers, listening to reader responses, and listening to larger conversations about language and inclusivity, Smith says. I defer to writers' preferences whenever possible, particularly when someone is writing about their own identity or a group they're a part of. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you are deferring to your writers' preferences most of the time, right or wrong, you are failing as an editor. Your job as an editor is to ensure that whatever is being published is free of grammatical errors, clear, and understandable. Inventing your own style guides? I mean, sure. I won't stop you, but serious writers will see you as a pushover, and experienced editors are going to point and laugh at you. Number five, seek out identity-based style guides. For the love of God, don't do this. Some advocacy groups put out their own style guides in an attempt to help editors and writers respectfully represent and report on specific identity groups. Such style guides include GLAD's Media Guidelines, the Radical Copy Editor, National Center on Disability and Journalism, a Conscious Style Guide, a Progressive Style Guide, and a Race Reporting Guide from Race Forward. How we talk and write about people is crucial when it comes to respecting identities and furthering social justice as a whole. We need to be thoughtful and critical about the decisions that are made and demand that writers, editors, and publications use language in a way that is responsible and non-oppressive. As readers and feminists, it is up to us to hold media accountable. But first, we need to understand the significance of seemingly small and unrelated rules, like what identities are capitalized and how those guidelines work to further white supremacy, misogyny, and other oppressions. Oh, these sentences make my brain crawl. What the fuck is responsible use of language? Language is a tool used to communicate and break down barriers, but you're acting as though it's a fucking wall. If your biggest concern about writing is whether or not identities are capitalized, you're too petty to be a writer. This is the equivalent of a mechanic complaining that his tools are broken because his wrenches aren't also a set of channel locks, and so he needs to invent an entirely new set of tools. And the end of that line... The hell? It's there in your own words. Guidelines. Guide lines. These are rules you don't have to follow. 
but you're acting like the Chicago Manual of Style is an academic supplement to mind fucking comf. The reason these style manuals exist is not to tell us exactly how we're supposed to write, but what to do when we encounter grammatical anomalies. Of course, your solution isn't to fix grammatical anomalies, it's to create more of them. Ah, oh, and apparently the author is a lawyer. A fucking lawyer. Advocating for changes in language, let alone changes that obscure language rather than clarify it. Tell me, Katie, did you actually pass the bar, or did you download a degree template from Google? I would expect a lawyer of all things to know the value of clarity in language, but I guess your regard for language is about as deep as this essay. Thank you so very much for watching. Go ahead and subscribe for more content, hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, or leave me a comment to let me know about your own thoughts on the matter. Good hunting to you, and I'll see you on the next one.